So you're just going to watch from your side. Test one, two. Good morning. You did. Go ahead and grab something to eat. Good morning, everyone. We still have another minute if you want to grab, some, uh, grab something quick from the buffet, and we'll get started. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. My name is Melissa Schreck, and I'm with the School of Public Health and Information Sciences. I'm the executive, I'm, I'm giving myself a promotion. I'm the director of external affairs. Um, I'm just going to do some light housekeeping before we get started. And uh, first off, if everyone could just take a minute and check your cell phones, make sure they're on silent. That'd be great. For our virtual guests, we have about 80 people joining us today from Zoom. Um, so we're excited to have you guys here as well. And we wanted to let you know that we will be muting all participants for the duration of the event. 
We're also recording the meeting. If you do not wish to be seen, then please um, go ahead and turn your camera off at this time. We have turned on closed captioning, so if anyone needs that feature, you should see a notification above closed caption slash live transcript in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. So you can go ahead and click the closed caption to start viewing those that transcription. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. And for our friends on Zoom, please drop your questions into the chat and we will ask those questions of Dr. Galea um, during, during the Q&A time. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kathy Baumgartner. Um, Kathy is our Associate Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs at the School of Public Health and Information Sciences. And I appreciate you being with us today. Good morning. <clears throat> well, I would like to say that on behalf of the University of Louisville uh, School of Public Health and Information Sciences for welcoming our 2023 Woodson Lecture featuring Dr. Sandra Galea, which we'll hear from soon, or who, who we will hear from soon. The Woodson Lectureship Fellow uh, Endowment in estab was established in 2014. It was actually an anonymous gift to honor two sets of parents who had died of cancer and the families wished to leave an endowment uh, for the school. We're most grateful for this gift, which makes it possible for us to bring both national and international speakers to our school. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Um, or Dean Craig Blakely for reaching out to Sandro Galea to ask him to please come and present at this Woodson Lectureship. I want to thank our team at the Office of External Affairs, Melissa Schreck and Paige Willis for handling the event logistics and the promotion as well as all of the colleagues at the, uh, the School of Public Health at Boston University uh, who were very helpful in arranging Dr. Galea's uh, trip here to Louisville, Kentucky. We're proud to host Dr. Galea as our distinguished speaker who will discuss how we can apply lessons learned during the COVID pandemic to ensure that public health matters in the upcoming decades. Dr. Galea is Dean and Robert A. Knox, professor at the Boston University School of Public Health. Prior to his appointment in Boston, Dr. Galea held an academic and leadership positions at Columbia University, University of Michigan, and the New York Academy of Medicine. He is the past chair of the board of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health and past president of the Society for Epidemiologic Research, he was also chair of the Community Services Board for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Galea has published extensively on the social causes of health, mental health, and trauma, and has documented the consequences of mass trauma and conflict worldwide. He's also a regular contributor to the media as well, including the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, the Boston Globe, and the New York Times. He has been named an epidemiology innovator by Time, and it's a top voice in healthcare by LinkedIn. Dr. Galea was born in Malta and immigrated to Canada with his family as a teenager. He holds a medical degree from the University of Toronto, graduate degrees from Harvard and Columbia, and an honorary doctorate from the University of Glasgow. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandra Galea. on? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Very good. Um, um, well, thank you all for having me. Thank you uh, to uh, Dean Blakely for extending the uh, generous introduction. Thank you all for being here. I understand that uh, this is the um, first in-person Woodson Lecture since 2019, and I feel like you all, like we are trying to navigate this sort of strange world of post-COVID and learning how to relive again. So I, I, I'm very grateful to you all for uh, being here, both in uh, in person and online as we try to figure out uh, the, um, uh, what it's like to reemerge after uh, the pandemic. So what I want to do is I, I, I want to talk about health and public health. And I sort of call this talk 
ensuring public health matters uh, in coming decades with um, um, uh, the double meaning with, uh, behind the word matters. And what I've been trying to do in my thinking and in my writing and in my speaking is to use the COVID moment to say, what do we learn from the moment? And what does learning from the moment look like in terms of thinking about public health moving forward and our mission, all of us in health moving forward. And to do that, I find myself going back to first principles, to what is health about? What is public health about? And then how does that apply itself to the COVID moment? And I, I think we're in a funny space right now where we're all sick of COVID, we're all sick of the pandemic. We'd like to just like move on and never talk about it again, which is an impulse which I understand very well. Um, and at the same time, I also feel like one doesn't, there's no way to redeem a tragedy like COVID, but really we owe the respect to COVID to at least make sure we're learning from it. So that's what I'm trying to do in my thinking, in my reading, in my writing, in my speaking. And that's what I'm going to try to do today. So I'm going to go back, as you'll see, very much to first principles about what is health, what generates health, what is public health, and then apply that to COVID and to show how what happened in COVID was entirely predictable and how it will happen again with another pandemic unless we deal with the fundamentals of what health is about. So that's really the arc of what I'm going to do. Um, uh, so I'll start with this, which is what causes health. And um, I, I, I often feel like we have a challenge in uh, public health we've always had about explaining what we actually mean by what public health does. And over the years, I have uh, in my writing come to use this story to tell the story of what health is. And this is a story of, uh, um, this is uh, one of the fathers of the blues, Blind Willie Johnson. If everyone knows the blues, you know Blind Willie Johnson. And, um, you know, Willie Johnson was born in Texas in uh, around 1900. And he was born sighted, but he lost his eyesight in a domestic violence incident at age seven. And uh, he grew up poor, blind, black in Texas in the early 1900s. He, um, he got married and him and his wife were living in a small house, which at one point burned down, but because they had no money, they actually, when the fire died down, they actually spent the rest of their lives living in the burnt out shell of the house. Um, um, he made a living busking by playing in street corners. Not a very good living, as you can imagine, but that's actually why we end up remembering him today, because some of his songs were recorded. And when he was in his early 40s, so it's Texas in the 1940s, um, uh, Willie Johnson got malaria, which wasn't uncommon. Texas 1940s, malaria was actually quite common. Some of you may know the CDC was initially started actually to control malaria in the southern states. Some of you from the CDC nodding their heads. Um, so it's quite common. Uh, his wife took him to hospital for his malaria and he was turned away from hospital and then he died so the, the reason i tell the story is to ask what killed blind willie johnson and you know when we're talking about this like this everybody here is sophisticated enough to know well what killed him was poverty and domestic violence and homelessness and racism and poor access to care but also malaria right had he received treatment for malaria which was available chloroquine he would have lived but when you hear the story of Blind Willie Johnson, you know that that's not enough. Because had he received malaria treatment, he might have lived that day, but something else was gonna get him, right? Like, like he had everything was, everything was stacked up against him. So the reason I think the story matters is because it illustrates, and as you're gonna see in a second, I think that story sort of, that haunts the rest of the presentation, because it illustrates the full range of what health is about. And it illustrates how unless we pay attention, yes, to malaria, but also to homelessness, to domestic violence, to poverty, to structural racism, to access to health, uh, to access to care, we are never going to create a healthier world. And that really is the foundation of health, I think intellectually of public health and practically of what happens and why we had such poor health achievement in a time of COVID. So, you know, so, just moving from the story to an infographic, but really tells the same thing. It's from the Institute for Clinical Health Improvement. And what, what it looks at is what causes health. And you see sort of in this figure here, um, um, you know, I think most people sort of get into the range of 10, 20% of health is due to healthcare, but then much else of health is due to health behavior, our smoking, our drinking, our physical environment, the cities we live in, our education, our job status, our family support, income, community safety, et cetera. I mean, this infographic, says the exact same thing as the blind Willie Johnson story does, 
but this sort of comes from an institute and we put it in our textbooks and we sort of tell the same story. But it is, while everybody in this room, while we all, because we're in this room, we nod at this and say, yeah, we know this. Sometimes it's hard to remember how far this is from where the world is on understanding health. And that perhaps was obvious in how much we let the world set itself up for such failure in a time of COVID. So that's number one, sort of what causes health. So how are we doing as a country on health? As I said, I'm gonna to come to COVID, but COVID comes later. Let me start with how we're doing on health before COVID. Well, badly. So we are doing poorly on health. So this is, um, this looks all the way up to 2015. And uh, what you see is that, um, you know, we've essentially sort of fallen off the curve starting in the, in the late 80s compared to other high income countries. And the US has about a five year lag in life expectancy with other high income country peers. And, you know, I often challenge audiences, particularly non health audiences to say, well, raise your hand if you voted to die five years sooner than the people in other high income countries. And people get very sort of squirrely about that. Say, well, I, I didn't choose that. Which my answer is, well, we did. I mean, th these are, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not like genetically, the Australians are actually predisposed to live five years longer. Surely nobody believes that, right? It is ultimately the social choices that we are making that result in us choosing to live five years less than, you know, let's say, Australians and, you know, God forbid, the French. Um, um, so this is, a, you know, I think it's important. It's important to think about these things as social choices. These are social economic choices that we are making as a country. And, you know, I, I, my, my general overriding feeling about these things always is that reasonable people would not make these choices if this was understood. And, and part of our challenge in health has been in the translation. And part of my, I was talking to some people yesterday, 2023 is my year of hope and optimism. Part of my motivation for 20 years a year of hope and optimism is that I do think that there is a COVID window where there's a much greater openness to discussing these things that, uh, than there was before COVID. And I think part of our mission, all of us who are in this room, should be to capitalize on that moment to make this case much more strongly than we ever have before. Um, you know, this, uh, this slide, I, I like this slide because I like the sort of irony, I like irony and I like the ironic title of American exceptionalism. And what this shows is the blue bars are when we were gaining on life expectancy compared to other high income countries. You see, so until the like, late 80s, we were gaining. And then the red bars are where we're actually doing worse. So we like flipped in the late 80s to starting doing worse, worse on life expectancies. We started losing life expectancy compared to other high income countries. So it's uh, the, uh, and again, all of this, like this is all ending sort of a long before COVID. And then the other aspect of how we're doing on health is that you cannot paint the picture of how we're doing on health in this country without talking about health divides. So I want to give the overall picture, but then also to make the point that there is a historically, there's been historically um, um, patterns of groups of, who are marginalized for whatever set of reasons. We often use race as a marker, as I'm going to talk about in a second. Race is just one of many markers who have been health left behind compared to other groups. So we collectively are worse than, than we should be and particular groups are worse than other groups in the country. And this looks at life expectancy, showing um, uh, black life expectancy is about been four years behind uh, white life expectancy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that has happened in COVID. So the overall picture is we have been worse than we should be, and there are groups that are worse than other groups. So now why? So why is it? So I'm going to bring the two together. Now, it's not a surprise I'm going to bring the two together, but I thought it's important to just start with sort of laying out what causes health and what we're doing in health. So why are we doing so poorly? Well, it's not because we're not spending money, right? So this is our expenditure on health. So the top line is US spending on health, and the other colorful lines are all the other rational countries. So we, uh, we spend about 40% more on health per capita than the next closest other country. Um, um, we spend um, about $3 trillion on health now a year, which is sort of like one of those numbers that's like meaningless. Like, what does that mean? It's just low zeros. You can't really wrap your brain around it. Um, uh, but um, we have the, so we spend more, our rate of change is more, and our 
change and rate of change is more. So like our second derivative is, is more than everybody else. So we are spending a lot of money on health, um, uh, which means you think that we should be getting you know, better value for our dot money. You know, I often ask people this question saying, think of any other consumer good. Can you think of any other consumer good which you are willing to pay more for, substantially more for, not just a little bit, like 40% more than you would getting the same consumer good, let's say in Canada, and that you're willing to do so, and that good is substantially worse. Like think of your smartphone. If I were to say to you, your smartphone is gonna cost you 40% more than it is if you buy a smartphone in Canada. And by the way, it holds less data and is slower. You'd say, well, I'm not doing that. <laughs> right? But it's what we do on health, right? It's, it's sort of, it's funny that we accept this on health. It's actually, um, uh, there is no other sector, there is no other sector in our society where we are so out of line and paying more than all other comparable countries, and actually our outcomes are worse. Sometimes when I talk about this, people say things like education, it's actually not true. Education, we're not paying more. We're roughly in the middle of the pack in terms of when you look at the other high income countries. Like there is actually no other sector than health where we are so out of line in payment and then the outcome. And I sort of feel like, these things represent national values. Like, I actually think it is entirely reasonable for a country to say, we care about health, we're gonna spend a lot of money on health. I think that's okay. The, I just wanna see the outcome reflect our expenditure. So like, it's the mismatch between our expenditure and our outcome that bothers me, not the spending so much. I, I sort of do feel like we as individuals spend things that we value like it's okay you value a real large tv screen pay buy a large tv screen right it's like it's a it's a leverage value, but don't spend so much money on a tv and then get a little tiny tiny black and white screen right you know like if you're gonna pay money for it get something that's really worth the money and that's the mismatch we have in health and now why is that well why that is now i'm bringing the two pieces together it's because our spending misaligns with what actually causes health so the, the bar graph on the left really represents the same thing as the um, you know infographic person I showed you like it's the same thing just now made as a graph you know medicine is in the depending five to twenty percent range genetics matter a little bit but the rest of it is environments behaviors and a whole bunch of other stuff but our spending right is all here our spending is ninety percent of spending is all on medicine so we spend all on the 10 twenty percent and by the way we do very well on the 10 20 percent so the good news is actually what we spend on we do well on in terms of in hospital outcomes we actually do quite well as a country it's something which we actually don't talk about like when you're over 75 and you're going to hospital probably actually if you're over 75 go to hospital you would you want to come to american hospital rather than a french hospital because you're actually going to do better here which is that's where all our money is going so that's good news like we are spending our money well, but of course that doesn't affect everything else. Um, and here's sort of the, to give you a sense of the spending. So this looks at uh, leaving aside social security. This, the blue is our spending on healthcare and the gray is our spending in, on everything else. And what you see is our projections are, this is now all of this is out the window in terms of post COVID and how spending is gonna real, realign post COVID, but leaving that aside, we're projected to spend more on healthcare and less on everything else. And I just wanna show you an example from Massachusetts. So, you know, um, um, I'm in Massachusetts where, as I'm gonna talk in a second, we have the highest doctor per patient ratio in the country. Boston, where I live in, where I live, I'm gonna show you that in a second, has, uh, we have 40% more doctors per, per person than the next closest city. So it's a very sort of health intensive state. But in a health and death state, I wanna show you our spending. There's a 15 year pattern of spending in Massachusetts. And look at this, 100% increase in spending on healthcare and more or less the same or decreased spending in transportation, housing, primary, secondary education, law and public safety, mental health, higher education, education, environmental education. So this is Massachusetts. I have no idea what the data are like in Kentucky. Um, uh, I suspect they're probably comparable to what they are in Boston. So like in a state that generally Massachusetts tends to like rank one or two in terms of health indicators in the state. But even then, we are making the same mistake, right, in Massachusetts. So just to, just to show how endemic this issue is um, for all of us. So really, you cannot have health without also paying attention to homelessness and loneliness and poor infrastructure, opportunities for um, recreation, poverty, all of those forces that we all realize, which 
you know, when I show this slide, if I were to show you the slide in isolation, I think everybody in this audience could say, yeah, but what can we do about it? But then if I would encourage you to think of the slide together with the blind Willie Johnson story. And you realize that actually we simply cannot ignore the slide, right? Because the, the, the mindset we get ourselves in in health is I show this and you're like, yeah, 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 I know, but I can't do much about it. So let's just focus on treatment or let's just focus on treating the malaria. But remember the blind Willie Johnson story? If you just focus on the malaria, he's still gonna die young, right? So, so this pushes us to say, how do we grapple with all this? And yes, it's harder. Yes, it's outside of our obvious remit. Yes, it's actually easier probably to just find a pill for everything, but actually finding a pill is still not gonna solve the problem. And as I'm gonna get to in a second, if there ever was a moment that revealed the fallacy of focusing just on treating malaria, metaphorically, it was COVID. Um, I wanna show you an example of Boston. I, I, um, I sort of inserted these slides after some of uh, a conversation, a lovely dinner we had yesterday, um, um, because I, I, um, I was talking to, to, to some folks, including Blakely and others, about um, sort of the situation here, Louisville and Kentucky, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that there are particular challenges, particular challenges to health here in Kentucky, but uh, I actually wanna show you challenges to health in Boston, where, where I'm at, and just to see so how, some of the things that I heard from you, from you all yesterday actually are identical to where I am in Boston. Again, this is Boston, which is, um, as I said, has a 40% more physicians per, per, per patient population than anywhere else uh, in the country. So I wanna show you this. This is uh, our um, um, subway, which is called the T in Boston. For any of you who ever visited Boston, you know that most of the time it doesn't work, but nonetheless, it's there. Um, um, and um, this is from, um, from a study that we had done a few years ago, and this looks at uh, percent of uh, diabetes by subway stop. So this is Arlington subway stop, we have about 3% people with diabetes, Haymarket 5%, and Roxbury Crossing and Mattapani have about 10%. So it's about a, you know, it's about two to five fold difference in diabetes. And uh, broadly speaking, these areas in Boston have about five times worse health indicators. And then you look at things like families below the poverty line, again, Arlington, Haymarket is about 3%, while Roxbury, Mattapani is about 16, 30%. You just look at people with a graduate, with a, with a um, college degree, 79, 72% here is 25, 16%. So broadly speaking, living in these areas, so you have about twice as good indicators on a whole bunch of uh, determinants of living. And uh, right, so there's this enormous difference in terms of health indicators and social indicators. And you know, this is despite the fact that these geographic differences are super small. Like actually this is Boston, this is like, this is like one mile apart, two miles apart, um, two miles apart from each other. And despite the fact that Boston is full of world-class hospitals that people from all over the world come to, to get care all the time. These, all these sort of yellows are, that are world-class hospitals and clinics. So Boston in a city where really, and Boston is not a big city. I mean, it's uh, it actually, the population of Boston itself is about 600,000 people. It's actually smaller than the population of Louisville as a city itself. Um, um, and it has this enormous density of hospitals, enormous density of doctors. Really, everybody has access to doctors. And we still have about a five-fold difference in health indicators in Boston, right? Which, which really makes the point, very, very simply, that it's not about the hospitals. I mean, it is about the hospitals or some things, but it's not about the hospitals, broadly speaking, for health overall. Um, so that's one example of Boston. And then I want to just show another example of history, because one of the challenges that we always have in health is that it's very hard to think of health as being part of a historical movement. And you know, this is true at the personal level as well as it's true at the population level. You know, at the personal level, you see a person in front of you and the person is sick. So like, you know, the person is in front of you and she needs a knee replacement and you're like thinking of today, she needs a knee replacement. It's very hard to think of that need for knee replacement today is a product of 50 years of having to work a hard job standing up the whole time, right? It's hard to see this trajectory. So I just wanna just show history. Um, and you know, I wanna talk a little bit about in particular, some of the history that has created such divides between identity groups. This is a picture of uh, where um, um, people were enslaved in Southern, in southern states. This is uh, the, the darker colors where people were enslaved in Southern states. Um, um, which led directly, as people here know, to a lot of history of things like redlining. This is a map of Detroit, um, um, and the red color is redlining in Detroit. For those who don't know history of redlining, briefly, it emerged from a federal program that was well-intentioned. It was intentioned to, um, 
um, get Americans to own homes is the home home ownership loan corporation. But to do that, they were creating maps to encourage people, um, bankers, to lend money for homes. And green areas were encouraged to lend. Red, red areas encouraged not to lend. Red areas were disproportionate to African American areas. And this history of redlining maps directly onto segregation today. Like it's actually pretty clear over a hundred years. This is Detroit. If you look at this area here, see there's a straight line there between red and amber. And this is actually maps still today. That's Eight Mile Road. Um, um, and uh, I, I was at the University of Michigan for several years. So uh, did a lot of work in Detroit. And the green dots are um, um, uh, black Americans. The blue dots are white Americans. You see, so there's a amazing history of segregation. And we've done studies that looks at this. So this map on the left is um, the map of redlining. So this is the 1930s. So the red is redlining. The map in the middle is home foreclosures that went with the 2008 economic recession. And the map on the right is poor health with the darker color being poor health, right? So you see 1930s, 2008, present day, and you see sort of this picture of historical burden, right? That goes from redlining to um, uh, foreclosure to poor health um, over history. So we have to see health as being part of a continuum that historical forces together with current day social and economic forces ultimately right what happens in the health of populations today. So then, you know, when you get at things like life expectancy gaps by particular groups, so the bottom right, this is the black white life expectancy graph that I showed you earlier. The uh, black Americans here is purple, white Americans is light blue. This is exactly the same figure I showed earlier, was remember in the, in the, in the green and black. But the reason I'm showing this is because I want to show you the other five panels. When you look over time, again, white Americans are um, light blue, black Americans purple. This is unemployment, higher among black than white. Um, college education, higher among white than black. Household income, higher white than black. Home ownership, higher white than black. Incarceration, higher black than white. Right? With these five panels, it would be shocking if this was any different. Right? It's like you recognize that this is inextricably linked to these other five panels, which of course brings us back to the blind Willie Johnson story I was telling you about. That, that it, it's not that different from the story of Blind Willie Johnson in the 1900s, 100 plus years ago, that you can't simply say, we're just going to deal with that, because that is linked to all these other forces, which then brings us back to thinking about health as a full comprehensive picture, and that if we want health to matter, if we want what we do in public health to matter, we must figure out a way to grapple with these other forces. And then one last sort of setup before I, then I talk to COVID is I do want to talk about the health gaps, because I do think that it is, you cannot think about health in this country without thinking about health gaps. And while we now are talking about health gaps much more than we used to, we remain very superficial in how we think about health gaps. We do, there is now much more conversation about, say, black, white health gaps, which is entirely appropriate and long overdue. But health gaps exist across multiple dimensions of identity in this country. Multiple dimensions essentially of that all reflect, broadly speaking, all reflect access to assets that promote health. Those assets that promote health are, by the way, the second slide I showed you, right? The, the, the sort of uh, the figure from the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement. It's really how much access you have on them. And we have to be careful, particularly when we talk only on, uh, about racial divides in health that we don't get into what some authors have referred to, sort of racial essentialism. There is nothing genetic that determines the difference in health. These are all um, social factors that result in access to resources. And, and access to resources are patterned in this country by race, by education, by income. And in all of those, we see the same patterns of health haves and health have nots. So just to show some patterns of this, this uh, looks um, at, um, life expectancy at birth by state, which is, again, all of this sort of reflects then patterns of health producing resources across different states. You have state, this is a now a state by gender, by race interaction, for example, I'm showing an example of a white woman in Minnesota, life expectancy of 83, black men in Arkansas, life expectancy of 68, it's a 15 year gap in life expectancy. Um, um, when you look at counties, you have about a 20 year gap between the highest and lowest um, 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 life expectancy counties. And you can barrow down to census tracts, which are substantially smaller than counties. You also have a, about a 20-year gap in uh, county life expectancy. 
And you can even get to within cities. So within cities, um, uh, I showed you sort of some gaps in Boston. Um, uh, and this looks at Seattle actually showing a 20-year gap in zip codes um, uh, well within Seattle. And I'm sure there are similar ones in Louisville. I, I don't know what the local geography is, but I'm sure it's very similar um, uh, here. So that's sort of a showing by geography. Now I want to show you by, um, uh, for example, by income. This is from a, um, a study that looked at the um, richest 20% of Americans and the poorest 80% of Americans. Um, uh, I think increasingly we are beginning to realize that the key, the key sort of asset gap in the country are between people who are college educated and those who are not. That essentially has you in the 20 to 20 to 40 percent of population, which is which has a four-year college degree, which tends to be mapping very clearly on people with the um, um, uh, with more resources and more income, and that group is separating from the poorest 60, 70 percent of Americans. So this looks at uh, the um, green is the richest 20 percent of Americans. And the 80% is everybody else. Notice how it's this called highest resources. And this is remainder of the population. This is a paper that our team did, which was published in JAMA journals. We actually called this when we submitted it richest 20% and poorest 80%. And the journal refused to, uh, to publish that language, which I thought was actually quite interesting. I thought it was entirely accurate to say richest 20% and poorest 80%. They, 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 they thought that that was uh, inflammatory. I'm not sure why. But anyway. It is the richest 20%, for example. So you see um, um, heart failure, angina, heart attack, stroke, right? Much lower in the richest 20% than, than everybody else. And then what is more amazing is angina and heart attack, as you see that the gap is widening. So this is richest 20%, poorest 80%, and you see, right, the gap widening over the past 20 years. So that's another dimension. Um, here's another dimension that characterizes our health gaps, which is neighborhood opportunity. This is essentially really illustrates, right, really illustrates the, the randomness of, of some of these and the injustice of some of these health gaps. This looks at the um, neighborhood you happen to be born in. So this is a, um, um, using a neighborhood opportunity scale, which essentially says what opportunities you have as a, if you're born in a particular neighborhood to then go on to have other jobs, etc. And uh, if you are not born in a very low opportunity neighborhood versus born in a very high opportunity neighborhood, you have a seven year gap in life expectancy, right? So this, by the way, captures, to my mind, the profound injustice of the inequitable asset distribution that patterns health, right? Because what could be more unfair than just where you happen to be born? You know, when, when I talk to lay audiences and, um, um, uh, you know, I often, the question I'm often asked is, you know, what is the one thing I need to do to make myself as healthy as possible? And the answer to me is obvious, which is you should choose to be born to well-off parents living in a very good neighborhood, right? And, uh, and I say that, and people generally sort of stop for a second. They're like, wait, wait, I can't choose that. I don't know, that's the whole point, right? We have no choice over that, but that patterns entirely our, um, uh, our health. And then uh, just to sort of bring these all together, the, the health gaps, because one of the things I find gets very muddled in our mind is like, you know, we spend a lot of time in health saying, well, what's driving the health gaps? Is it race or is it income or is it wealth? You know, the answer is it's all these things. Like it's all these things together. These are all axes. These are all axes that represent um, uh, access to assets that promote health. And just to show that by way of illustration, this actually brings together race and income. And this is multiple sort of diseases. You have COPD, asthma, et cetera. Just, let's just say focus on asthma, just to look at the same one here. And this is the dots our census tracts, and this is more income here, and this is a burden of asthma. So what you see is the higher income, right? There's a best fit line that goes down, you see it? So like more income, less asthma. But then the dots also have colors in them, and the more purple the dot, the greater the share of the black population in that census tract. And what you see is the black population is concentrated at the lower income, more asthma, even as the overall picture, right, is more income, less asthma. So this is just an example of how these various measures of identities, these markers of identity all come together. But fundamentally, right, what it's all capturing is, is access to the resources that keep us healthy. Access to those resources that want to show you the initial figure are ultimately what generates health. And these are patterned by any number of markers of racial identity, income, education, wealth, um, that often go together.
Okay, before I flip, flip to COVID now, I want to just make one key point. Because when I present the picture of health overall, remember I said the picture of health overall, and then I talked about health gaps. One of, the, one of the challenges with that thinking is that one can get oneself into the mindset that say, okay, okay, I get it that our health overall is bad, but you've also told me about these health gaps. So therefore, the reason our health overall is bad is because it's being driven down by people who, who are health left behind. And as long as I'm in a position of privilege, I'm going to be okay. And, you know, I may care about people who are marginalized because I'm a good person, but ultimately, this is not affecting me. And I think it's important to remember that that's actually false, that actually this affects all of us. This is sort of, I like this quote, the problems of any of us are problems of all of us. And, you know, before COVID, I often would use infectious disease examples to make this case. And now COVID has made that sort of obvious, I'm going to get to it in a second. But I just want to show you a non-infectious disease example to make this case. I'm going to show you an example of maternal mortality. This actually is from data that a lot of people have caught it. There was a report that came out recently that captured media attention quite a bit. You know, maternal mortality in this country is extraordinarily high. Um, uh, so this is uh, maternal mortality for us compared to other high-income countries, right? So we're really like uh, three, four times higher than other high-income countries. But what is important, so that's overall, right? What's important, though, I mean, that is important, period. But the point I want to make here is that when these data are subset to white Americans in the 1% richest counties, this is just the 1% richest, most privileged people in the country, this is their maternal mortality, which is still twice as high as all other high-income countries, right? So the point is, we are poor health overall. Yes, we have health gaps, but all of this affects all of us. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because I do think that in health, we do need to make the argument to the world that these are things that matter for all of us, that we're all in this together, that the right thing to do, which is to remove health gaps and to improve health, is also the smart thing to do because we're all in this together. And of course, if there ever was anything that showed us that we're all in this together, it was COVID. So now, with that setup, with the explanation sort of for health overall, I wanna talk a little bit about COVID. I wanna talk about what happened in COVID and why it happened in COVID and why COVID as it happened was inevitable given our health, which of course then leads us to saying that we need to deal with these things to avoid the same thing happening with the next pandemic. So COVID was bad, it was really bad. Um, uh, about 1.1 million Americans died in COVID. Um, COVID in 2020 became the third leading cause of death. This is right here after heart disease and cancer. It was also a third leading cause of that in 2021, um, which right now we're sort of numb to all this. And it's like, you know, I say that and it's a little bit of an eye roll. It goes, but if I tell you that 2025, the third leading cause of death is going to be a disease that today you've never heard of, that is named with a series of letters you've never put together before. It's sort of hard to remember today, right? I remember in March of 2023 that the letter COVID you had never put them together in a sequence unless you know you had uh, you mistyped something, right? It just it just it just wasn't it didn't exist COVID. So if I tell you today in 2025 something else with a sequence of letters that doesn't exist is going to become third leading cause of that, you're like, holy cow, we shouldn't let that happen. Well, that's exactly what happened in COVID. It came from nowhere, became the third leading cause of that. And you know, we did badly. Like it just is actually very simple. This is a sort of cumulative deaths during the pandemic. This is us compared to other high income countries. This is deaths during the Omicron wave. So objectively, we as a country did worse than all other high income countries. And you know, we should sort of, uh, we should just sort of not debate that anymore. There, there, is, a, there is a question overall in terms of other big countries. Um, uh, we did objectively worse. There's a question as to how China's going to end up at the end because of their utter catastrophe of, a, of an approach, which we can talk about in the Q&A, but we did worse than all the high-income countries. And we also deepened health gaps enormously. So this looks at our drop in life expectancy. So overall, as a country, we had about a two, so the black line you see is overall, um, uh, we had about a two and a half um, a year drop in life expectancy overall, sort of tracks with where white life expectancy is, it's right there together. Um, uh, black life expectancy dropped by about three and a half to four years. Um, astonishingly, native life expectancy dropped by about six and a half years. Native American life expectancy dropped by six and a half years. Just to, just to put that in context, um, uh, we've never had a drop like that in life expectancy with the exception of the subgroup 
of young men sent off to fight in World War II. That's the only time we've had a drop like that in life expectancy. We've had drops in life expectancy for the past 100 years. Typically, those drops are in the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 range. So a six-year drop in life expectancy is sort of it's like mind-boggling. It's actually hard. It's hard to wrap your brain around it. So COVID wrought havoc overall and wrought havoc in our health camps. So then it brings us to why it happened. So why did COVID happen? And you know, anybody who's in the audience who's feeling punchy this morning, the, you know, the, the, the cynical answer is, well, it was the virus, stupid. I get that. I'm here to make the case it was not actually about the virus. It actually was for three reasons. Our social structures before the pandemic, our health before the pandemic, which obviously are intimately linked, and how we had invested in what could help us during the pandemic. Those are the three reasons why COVID was what it was. So let me talk about each of them. Let me start with our social structures. Um, you know, as you could probably guess from my talk, I could spend a whole sort of hour talking about social structures. But let me just do it in two slides. And uh, I'll, I'll show one example of a social structure that, that resulted in what happened during COVID. And one of those examples was new infectious disease happens. We don't know about it. Scary, terrifying, et cetera, right? March of 2020, everybody running around. And we say, new infectious disease. How do we deal with it? Well, Everybody stay home. Don't touch each other so we don't spread it to each other, right? That was our approach. That was our instinctive approach. And of course, that approach was, came from people in positions of power, including people in academic establishments like us. We all said, infectious disease, everybody stay home. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, who could stay home? This is um, your ability to work remotely by income quarter, top 25% of income. 62% of people could stay home. This is before COVID, by the way. This is from Bureau of Labor Statistics data. So we knew this. This is like data that was known. But in fact, the other three quarters of income, only a minority of people actually could stay home among working people. So when you look at this now, when you look at this now, my challenge to us is knowing this, and we knew this, right? This is, these are data from 2019. Should our first reflexive response to new scary infectious disease be stay home? Because what's going to happen with this picture if you say to the world, way to deal with new scary infectious diseases, stay home? Well, you know what's going to happen, right? What's going to happen is these people are going to die less than those people. These people, richest 25%, which is, by the way, us. These people, poorest 75%, everybody else is going to die more, right? That is what's going to happen. So I am now projecting March 2020, this was going to happen, and that's exactly what happened, because who died during COVID? This is the disproportion who died during COVID. Construction workers, manufacturing workers, laborers, cooks, bus drivers. Those are the people who died during COVID. It's these people over here. So, you know, I, I would be careful that I am presenting us with the challenges that I think COVID revealed and hopefully showing how these challenges were represented patterns that were there before COVID. But also there is here a deeper story, which is how we should have thought about this in the time of COVID. Now, I, want, I would like to cut us some slack, although it's hard to cut, cut us slack in the context of a tragedy like this, that we were all terrified and we did what we thought was the right thing. But at the same time, this we knew. And the fact that this would lead to this was obvious, right? So the underlying social structure, which in this case, I'm just using one example, right? Social structure, which is the, the, our social structure of economic working conditions and who could do what. And I know, that, I know the response to this, where you can say, well, what else did you want us to do? What else could we do? And, you know, I think there's some interesting questions there. Let me ask you a sort of tricky question. Raise your hand here. Raise your hand. If you worked from home at least part of the time during the pandemic. Okay. Now, raise your hand if when you worked from home, you never, never got anyone deliver anything for you. One person. It's awkward, right? 
Awkward, right? Because why was it okay for me to work from home and get other people to take the risk to deliver stuff for me, right? So, so I'm, I'm raising this as a difficult question that we should be grappling with. So number one was our underlying social structures. That's why things went so right, wrong COVID. And by the way, this overlaps with a disproportionate uh, burden of black and brown Americans who actually work in these frontline jobs. This looks at black Americans more like in grocery convenience stores, public transit workers, trucking workers, building, etc. right? So again, hopefully you're all seeing the picture of how these various axes of disadvantage all work together to create the picture of who died disproportionately during COVID. So that's number one was underlying social structures. Number two is our health during before the pandemic. So I've already painted the picture of our health during, before the pandemic, so now I've told you all this, right? When COVID hit, we were sitting ducks because we were unhealthy as a country. It had nothing to do with COVID, right? I've made that case hopefully already. And here is what we knew. This is data from February of 2020 from the China CDC. The COVID started in like China and Hubei province. Um, um, and data in February 20, before the first cases here, probably there were already some cases, but we didn't know about it, that's fine. Um, um, heart disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease. If you had underlying disease, you're much more likely to die than if you didn't have underlying disease, right? So we knew this before COVID ever hit the country, right? Of course, that meant that we were going to do very badly. Because remember, we had much greater burden of underlying disease than did all these other countries. So it's then not a surprise this is us, this is mortality. These are all the US and it's broken up by black and Latino here, um, uh, doing much worse than other countries in no small part because we were more unhealthy than these other countries to begin with. And our poor health was patterned by all these other conditions that I've been talking about. This actually looks at patterning by income. This is more income and the yellow is having illness that makes you vulnerable to COVID, higher income, less likely you are to have underlying illness makes you vulnerable to COVID. The green bar, by the way, is mental health problems, which makes you vulnerable to mental health problems after COVID. Again, higher income, less likely you are to have mental health problems. So this means that the people who are going to get sicker during COVID were people who already had underlying disease, who are lower income people, and disproportionately people of color. This looks at black and white Americans, high blood pressure, diabetes, showing um, black Americans is blue, white Americans is red, younger ages, middle ages, older ages, greater burden, high blood pressure diabetes among black Americans and white Americans, right? So disease hits, we know it affects people who are sicker more, and we know who's sicker. It is people who are already have less access to health producing resources, and we know that those groups are going to be more vulnerable. That couples with the social structures that then exposes those groups more to COVID. Right? So the two forces come together to create the perfect storm that was COVID and its consequences, and in particular, how those consequences were lived um, by people in different occupational, different identity groups. That results then in these gaps in life expectancy. For example, these are black men compared to white women over here. And number three is our investments on what could have helped us during the pandemic. Well, this is the work that everybody here in this room, I mean, what were investments that could have helped us during the pandemic? Well, this is uh, our systemic underinvestment in state and local public health workforces that we had been shrinking systematically um, um, for the past 20 years before COVID. Um, uh, I know some of you have uh, taken a look at my book, Contagion, next time. And you know, one of the first lines in the book is, I say, well, we're sitting ducks. Well, we're sitting ducks because of these conditions I'm talking about. We were an unhealthy country. We had social structures that predisposed us to the ravages of COVID. And we had underinvested in public health infrastructure. So really, COVID didn't have to try very hard to do the damage that it actually did. Um, so you know, we lagged in vaccination. This is vaccination, and this is booster vaccination behind all the other high income countries. And when we did vaccinate, we we were an embodiment of the inverse care law. Some of you will recognize the inverse care law. It was articulated by Julian Tudor Hart in 1971, 52 years ago, which essentially says that people who need care the most are the ones who are least likely to get it. This looks at counties. Each bubble is county, different sizes, different size counties. These are the most vulnerable counties, the most sick counties. These are least vulnerable counties. 
And the average line is average vaccination. What you see is the most vulnerable counties average vaccination is substantially lower than the least vulnerable counties average vaccination. So we succeeded in vaccinating more the areas that needed it less, right? So our systems were such that we were able to protect those who needed less. It doesn't mean that everybody did need protection, but there's different levels of protection needed based on these underlying conditions. And we delivered more protection to those who needed it less. And you know, in terms of infrastructure investment, we really, COVID really exposed our in, under investment in simple things like approaches to communication in a time of COVID. And you know, there's been a lot of, like a lot of the stuff has been, has been partisanized. I don't think politicalized is the right word, because things really been big and partisanized. People blame, well, it's all about the politicians. And I really have a hard time with blaming, blaming politicians. I think different, all sectors really stumbled here. And fundamentally, we stumbled collectively in having in trust that populations could trust us. And the trust requires political will, but also technical capacity in engaging communities. You know, one of the things that would happen is, um, in time of COVID, I talked to the media all the time until 2021, and end of it, I said, enough, I don't talk to the media anymore. And uh, it was like one of the questions I would get is like, well, how do we get people to trust us? Which my answer is, you don't get people to trust you in the middle of a crisis. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Maybe people trust you before a crisis. And uh, it's, it's, like, it's like being in a ship and uh, that's sinking. And you're like, well, how do we fix the hole in, in the bow in the bow right now? Like, I don't know. We should, we should have fixed it before we got into the storm, right? Um, so we had, you know, stumbling in our technical capacity. That's where the public health part comes in. In communities who are really disengaged because they saw that health wasn't working for them. And in political will and in political forces coming together to actually deal with a common problem. All of those things led to massive lack of trust in populations. And, you know, remember that as COVID happened, it was over superimposed over many other issues. Like, for example, the opioid epidemic. Like, this is the opioid epidemic that was, had been going up for two decades. So we had plateaued just before COVID, and then only to go back up by about 30% in the time of COVID. So all of this was our underinvestment in these forces. And just to give one example, of real underinvestment is like actually we were one of only two countries in the world where we actually had more road traffic deaths during pandemic rather than less. All the other countries had less road traffic deaths. Why? Because fewer people were driving. But actually we had more road traffic deaths because fundamentally it's just our underinvestment in the simple things actually protect us from things like road traffic deaths. So just one perfect example of our underinvestment. So I want to close because I want to have time to have some questions. Just a couple of uh, of uh, concluding remarks. Number one, hopefully I've shown that's really not about the pandemic. The picture I'm using in the back is of actually a plague in uh, um, uh, the Black Plague in Europe, where about a third of the Europeans died in the 15th century. Um, um, but you know, when you read accounts of historical pandemics, when you read accounts of the 1918 pandemic, a lot of what happened then is exactly the same as what happened now. And it is, it is to our, to, it really is to our discredit that we allowed that to happen again. And I suppose part of what I'm trying to do here is to make sure that it doesn't happen again when the next pandemic happens. There will be another pandemic. Hopefully not in my lifetime, but certainly some lifetime of some of you in this room, there will be. Um, uh, on, but then again, even though I say that, I realize there's no reason why there won't be another pandemic in 2025. You know, we make this fallacy of like, just happen now, it's not gonna happen again. But it may well happen again in a, in a couple of years. Um, uh, I wanna end on a sports metaphor because I want to end on a high. Um, um, this is the best soccer team in the world. This is the West Women's National Soccer Team. And now, uh, you know, I guess you heard in the bio, I grew up in Malta, which means I only care about soccer as a sport. And uh, for those of you who don't know soccer, sorry for you, but it's, you know, it's really played with 11 people on one side, 11 on the other. And you're just to score in the other net. If nobody scores on you, you never lose. And there's a goalie, that's the woman wearing black in the middle. Um, uh, she can use her arms, her legs, her whole body to stop the ball from going in the, in the net. And the other 10 players can only use their feet, hence football. Um, um, so, you know, when you hear that, and if I were to tell you, you have a billion dollars, build the world's best soccer team, you're going to say, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just buy the world's best goalie. And she'll keep the ball out, and I'll never lose. But if you look at the professional soccer game, and you look at the goalie, you know what she's doing? She's pacing the whole time in front of her net and yelling at her fellow players. And you know what she's yelling at them? She's saying, keep the ball away from me. Because if you've stood under any soccer net, you'll know it's very big. It's a very big net. And the best goalie knows that she's going to lose the ball if the ball comes at her fast net. Now, why am I telling you this? You know, the goalie 
is what we do clinically to save ourselves. It is our treatment in our hospitals. It is vaccines when the pandemic hits. It is the monoclonal antibodies for when you're really sick from COVID. Those things are all important. It is really important to have a good goalie. But if you just have a good goalie, you're still gonna lose without the other 10 players. And the other 10 players are all the aspects I'm talking about here. It is actually creating the social structures, making sure that people actually have um, uh, education, opportunities for recreation, safe communities, all of those things that ultimately will generate health. And without that, you will always lose. Um, um, the book on the left is The Contagion Next Time, the book which actually came out in um, 2021, which I see some of you have. The book on the right is coming out in the fall of, uh, this, um, of this year, 2023. And it's called Within Reason, and it sort of makes an argument for a public health that is, learns from COVID and moves forward with aligning its values with what we need to do together, which roughly reflects what I've talked about um, in my talk. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for having me. I think we have time for questions. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have a question? We have a couple minutes. Thanks so much. Um, early in your, your talk, you used the, the word, the COVID window. With, with the implication that we have a golden opportunity here. But uh, is, I'm sensing that the, the public kind of is kind of done with public health, both uh, in terms of financial commitment and sort of the, the attitude now that things that uh, are a result of the, in, in their words, lockdown, are coming to, coming to roost, and then they've forgotten all about about the deaths. So the, the question is, do you have an insight uh, of how we might use this this window? And do you come out guns a blaring and say, you know, show people more of the data, or do you say we've got to do this thing in a subtle yeah. way that people don't notice yeah. yet still do it? Yeah. So um, thank you for the comment. I think you're making two separate comments. Let me take them apart. Uh, one of them is, you know, you mentioned about public being tired of public health, and I agree with that. And I agree with that. And actually, the book Within Reason tackles that, and it tackles. You know, in my talk here, I've been, I was pretty gentle on public health, um, uh, sort of making us all to be the, you know, the good guys. I, I don't think we were all the good guys. And I could give another talk where I sort of make a reference to the fact about the things that we actually did wrong. Um, uh, so I do think a lot of our responsibility in public health is to reckon with our shortcomings. I think it's very easy for all of us in health to say, ah, it was the politicians. If only the pol oh, it was social media. It's all true. I think there's plenty of blame to go around in the political sphere, plenty of blame to go around in the media sphere, but I think there's plenty of blame in public health as well. So I do think that in public health, we need to do a reckoning with our own shortcomings. That's number one. Number two, um, I, I also, I think it's true that there is a moment of opportunity, a window of awareness about these issues. And, and I think it's particularly, it's particularly salient for those of us who work in schools, because we actually, the next generation, you know, our students, I think, are alert to, alive to, awake to these issues in a way that I've certainly never seen in so 25 years in academic, um, in academic health. Um, so I do think there is a moment to make this point and to make these points and to push towards a more expansive vision of health that is made through the argument that it is it is non-discretionary to tackle this broader vision of health if we actually want to solve these problems you know to come back to go back to blind willie johnson that it, it is not good enough to simply say let's just invest in treatment of malaria because all the other stuff is too hard that actually it's all the other stuff that's going to kill us. And that somehow we need to wrap our brain around it. And then the question is like, well, how do we do that? The answer is there are many small, many examples around the country of people do, doing inventive, creative things. And I suppose our job in um, academic health is to teach people that this is what needs to be done and look to see solutions emerge. Okay, we have one more question. Um, from uh, Dr. Asha Brown, who is connected with us virtually. How do you make sense of the relationship public health has with our economic structures of capitalism? Yeah, um, um, 
You know, we live in a market-driven economy. Um, um, I think the um, I think it's it's too easy to throw away the baby of a market-driven economy out with the bathwater of an unregulated market-driven economy. So I think we have to be very careful about um, um, uh, about saying that uh, it is ultimately all about capitalism. I, uh, having lived in uh, in other social systems, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that humans have devised a better social economic system than a market-driven economy. But I think also the case that, and this is why I use the term unregulated, that um, a market-driven economy has all sorts of regulations, and it is the regulations which is the the guardrails that determine what how we do it, what we incentivize, what we disincentivize, that really matter. The, what happens in the public space is we get into this, uh, into this sort of false argument as though there were such a thing as a truly unregulated market-driven economy versus a communist type system. And this is just this is a false dichotomy. The truth is our, the world around us is all structured with regulations of all kinds. Really the argument should be to my mind about what regulations, what guardrails we choose, what incentives we choose. And that means that we should incentivize what we value. And if we value health, we should incentivize health. And I think that can be achieved within a market-driven economy. If anybody's interested in this, I just had an academic book that came out this year called The Commercial Determinants of Health, which actually talks about how commercial forces um, uh, shape health. And uh, you know, historically, the argument about commercial determinants was uh, in public health, it used to be a bit of a reflexive um, what I would call a harmful product approach, which is to say, well, companies produce cigarettes, therefore we don't work with companies. I think this is a vastly too simplistic approach. I think fundamentally, a large part of the world around us is produced by private entities. This building was built by private entities. Um, um, so our job is to figure out how to align incentives such that market actors actually do things that generate health rather than harm. Thank you very much. If you all will join me again in thanking Dr. Galea for being here with us today. On behalf of the School of Public Health and Information Sciences, I want to thank you, Dr. Galea, for being with us and for all of you all for joining us today, both in person and virtually. Have a great day.